because there couldn't be a more perfect time for us to look at this than now. I think for most of us and probably all of us, the past month has brought a lot of drastic change to our lives, both personally and professionally. And it's affecting, it's affecting us in a myriad of ways, but it's a big wave to ride. And I think that it's these hard and raw times in life that crack us open. And if we're willing, there's an opportunity here for us to emerge with some new strategies. And that's what I wanna share with you tonight. My experience with this started with struggle. And I think that that's how growth starts for many of us. I hit a sort of climax of anxiety in my life that had been building and hanging out for a few years. And I knew at that time that I was looking for a different way to engage with life, but I didn't really know what that meant yet. I once heard Eckhart Tolle say that the most important question we can ask ourselves is are we in resistance to the present moment? And you know that really hit me and that really spoke to me because it doesn't imply that we like what's happening or that we agree with what's happening and it doesn't justify bad behavior. But it did bring my attention to how much time I was spending fighting what is. It was a time where my mind was restless and judgmental and I don't remember the exact moment, but at some point it occurred to me that I had more choices in this than I was seeing. And since I have found that acceptance, which we often think of as a passive or a weak state, has actually proved to be quite the opposite for me. Often when we think about change, we think about changing the external world, but it is equally as powerful for us to change our internal world and our experience of life. And this has really freed me up to see solutions that just weren't present for me before. In fact, acceptance and change, I now realize, are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand. And after some time, I began to realize that in fact, how we interpret life is a choice. And these choices are creating our experience. We are authoring our lives and we have the ability to shift our experience. And so what a better time than now for us to hone some of our skills that we all innately have. Our opportunity here is to witness the domino effect in our life that comes from changing our perspective and from zeroing in on our choices. Yeah, there are many things in our lives that are out of our control. But while we're together tonight, let's look at what is in our control and the possibility that there may be more room for choice in how we're looking and responding to life than we realize. So recently, I've really started thinking about this idea of emotional immunity. One of my colleagues, Lauren Hubelet, brought this idea to my attention. And when we typically hear of the word immunity, we think about our physical immunity, which is vitally important. But we really need both. My experience of emotional immunity is that we have the ability to adapt to whatever it is that we encounter. And it's our ability to ride the wave of our thoughts and experiences with resilience and stability that really allow a shift in our nervous system. Our nervous system can be thought of as the wiring for the body. And it has a few branches that drastically affect the way we feel. So there's the sympathetic nervous system, which controls our response to perceived threat. And this is what we hear being referred to as the fight or flight response. And we generally feel when we're in this state the way we would if we were in danger. So there's often anxiety, I 
how long rest I guess. Conducive to us feeling calm and to and when we do our short circuit, it's our emotional immunity that allows us to become aware of how we feel and to have the tools to choose again and to recalibrate. And this ability is really always relevant because even when life opens back up and we're not in the midst of a pandemic, there is always stimuli that is unpredictable, both personally and professionally that are coming at us. So before we really move on, let's start with the most effective and quick strategy that we can use when we're feeling anxious and reactive. And that's our breath. So we're gonna take a minute here and just take a few deep breaths and just observe them. Are they in your chest or your abdomen? Are they shallow or deep? Maybe you feel like you're just getting stuck somewhere. If you watch a baby after they're born, you'll notice that their abdomen is rising and falling effortlessly. And when we breathe fully and slowly, we stimulate the vagus nerve, which controls organ function. Our heart rate slows and our blood pressure decreases and our muscles can relax. And when we're taking deep, slow breaths into the abdomen, we move our nervous system back into a parasympathetic place. And so we can use this as a reset throughout the day. And if we take this a step further, if we take full and deep breaths while we're problem solving and making decisions, I have found that it really changes what I come up with. So right now, just bring one of your hands down to rest on your abdomen just below your navel, wherever it lands is fine. And just take a few deep breaths, focusing on rehabituating your breath from a shallow chest breath back to our natural state of breath, which is in the abdomen. And even though I would love to be joining with you all in person tonight, I think there are a few silver linings to us meeting like this. And I think the fact that we're all in our own space and in the privacy of our own homes offers us some freedom here to practice this while we're together. And if you wanna turn the camera off, turn the camera off. We spend a lot of our young lives going to school and nurturing our intellect. And we receive a lot of positive reinforcement in our society and in our professional lives for that. But what we don't receive much guidance on or much clarity on is our personal and inner wellness on how to let go and how to settle. And when we're able to develop both of these together, the sum is really so much greater than the parts. In fact, in my experience, it produces more productivity, not less. So let's touch on a few areas here that act as a springboard. When we're talking about the way that we engage with life, we always have to talk about neuroplasticity. And we know that we're creatures of habit. And our habits are like grooves in the brain that get deeper and deeper as we follow our usual thought patterns. But when we interrupt our habitual behavior, we can actually establish new pathways. And this, about, uh, this ability to establish new pathways is really freedom for us. It's the challenge to realize that we have this choice the process by which we assign meanings to an event or a circumstance often happens so quickly that there's little or no space between the response to it, the stimulus, and the response to it. And the mistake that we make here is that we mistake this for objective truth. And this is what keeps us locked in our habits. 
there's no way to ever know everything about a situation. How's the past? So I think it's actually quite logical for us to assume that we don't know. In Buddhism, you'll hear that people talk about the difference between pain and suffering. And in this context, the pain can be physical or it can be emotional. It can be something like an injury or a death, but it can also be just a conversation or a text or even a thought. And these are the facts of the situation. These are the stimuli and the parts that often are not in our control. However, there's another factor here, which is the interpretation or the meaning that we give to the facts. And our self-talk or our beliefs about what's happening are driving our emotional reactions. So a common example of this is personalizing. So when another person acts in a way that we don't care for, they're just showing us where they are in that moment. It probably has nothing to do with us. But if we choose to believe that it has something to do with us, then that's our interpretation of it. And that part is a sort of a story that we made up. It's a choice. And it's really important that we look at this because this defines our whole experience of life. So the pen and the paper that you have with you, we're gonna stop here and let's jot down three things. We're gonna write down an event that was triggering recently. And that can be something big, but it can also be a conversation that's just sticking with you or a text that you received. And then we're gonna jot down how it made you feel. And the third thing is why you feel this way. So if we look at this, we have number one, the situation that triggered you. And that's the stimulus, that's what happened. And then we have number two, which is how it made you feel. And then the third part really offers, offers us an opportunity. This is why you feel this way. And what number three is really showing us and why it offers opportunity is because this is our choice in the situation. This shows us our interpretation of it. And we can bring some choice into the situation by looking at it and utilizing mindfulness. Most of you have heard this word, and it's simply the practice of bringing all of our attention to the present moment. And when we veer off again, we just bring our attention back again and again. And this allows our mind to shift away from focusing on the constant internal monologue that we all have. And this is really key. There's an author named Michael Singer who writes about mindfulness and the incessant chatter that we all have. And he suggests that the brain just generates thoughts all day long. But we can really start to free ourselves from this by just watching the thoughts and not always identifying with them and believing them. When we identify or believe with a thought, what we're doing is we're reaching out and grabbing on and holding on to it. And it often tends to hang around for longer when we do that. The first time a trigger happens and we don't immediately react to it, it's powerful. You actually feel different. This in no way means that you don't have feelings about what's happening. It's just that you're offering yourself an opportunity to pause and you can decide to respond, but maybe you can decide to respond once your nervous system has recalibrated and you're thinking in a calm and clear way again. And what's even more surprising is that sometimes 
we realize that the response or the reaction that was our old normal or that was our habit and that we would have immediately done in the situation, it actually may not be as productive or as relevant as it seemed in the moment. There's a real power in pausing here. And it allows us to use the opportunity to choose and to not just feel like we're along for the ride or that we're a victim of outside circumstances. But let's talk about what happens when we're just seeing red and we are flooded with emotion because this is real life. So I'm not suggesting that you deny how you're feeling or fabricate thoughts or feelings that are not genuine. What we're talking about here is honing our ability to ride the wave of what comes up. So when emotions and thoughts rise up, we have the option of just allowing them to wash over us like a wave. Just really feel them without telling a story. For example, if you're noticing intense anger, just call it what it is. But when we switch that and we identify it and we say, I am angry, and I'll just make a situation up here. I am angry because my brother is a jerk and he always does this. Now we have really grabbed on. We've made an I statement. We've got a story to back it up and we're blaming. Surprisingly, when you just let the wave pass over you, it tends to pass quicker than you might guess. And yeah, this strategy definitely takes some practice. And this is where the neuroplasticity comes in. And that is key because we can develop this as an ability. And it becomes a new habit and it changes everything. So let's compare this to what happens when we're flooded with emotion and we take it on and we start attacking and defending and telling a story about it. Because interestingly, we're likely to believe that story and that wave is gonna hang around for a lot longer. Often when we're triggered, it's because we're looking outside of ourselves for a feeling of validation and wholeness. And let's relate this to our health for a minute. When we talk about wellness, we are not talking about creating a state of health. What we're talking about is looking for the blocks or the obstacles to our body and our mind being able to express its natural state of health. And the same is true for our emotional identity, uh, immunity. So when we're talking about emotional immunity, we're not talking about creating wholeness or creating worth. Our worth is intrinsic. It's not dependent on, on any of our accomplishments or our finances or our careers or whatever. Our worth is not something that can be earned. So all the work that many of us are doing to try and feel whole or to feel like ourselves might not work because nothing outside of us can make us realize that we are what we want to be. But we often consciously and unconsciously make decisions or set goals, believing that that thing is finally going to help us feel content or to feel whole. And when we let this story go, we have given ourselves such a gift and taken a weight off that maybe we didn't even realize that we were holding. I'm not in any way saying that we shouldn't work to accomplish our dreams. We just need to separate out what our goals are. Let's accomplish our dreams because it's going to be an amazing experience, not because it's going to change anything about how we feel about ourselves. I think we've all experienced the feeling of hoping that if we change something in our body or our career or our relationship status, that we might feel more like us or feel more whole. And we all know that there's that initial reaction that comes with a new thing or a new relationship, but really quickly we're back to feeling however we were feeling about ourselves before. And that's because nothing outside of us can make us realize 
that we already are everything that we wish we were. And the stories that we're telling ourselves about what we need to be whole, those are the blocks and the obstacles to us realizing our wholeness and our worth. And one of the gifts that this might bring is that it might seem like we would lose our motivation to accomplish, but it's actually the opposite. Instead of being limiting, we can step forth into the world knowing that we're whole. And this opens us up to accomplish and try things without the weight of doing it because it's gonna garner respect or power or all the other things that we've been telling ourselves that we need to get ahead. Often when we're triggered, we're looking outside of ourselves for that feeling of wholeness. And we usually experience this as looking for control or looking for respect or love or acceptance. And typically we think of these as passive things, that we think of these as things that we need to receive from somebody else. But we can really flip this on its head and we can view these things as abilities. And that reinforces that they, have, that they are within us that they're ours to cultivate and ours to offer ourselves. And when we nurture, yeah, we nurture these things in other people, right? We know that. And other people nurture these things in us. But it's not an all or nothing situation. And this is the perfect time to recognize this. One of the ways, if not the main way, that we recognize and cultivate this in ourselves is by sharing it and cultivating it in somebody else. So if we want to feel accepted, try accepting someone else. When we want to feel accepted, again, let's accept and acknowledge somebody else, knowing that we don't need them to respond or behave in any certain way. Because just by sharing that and just by offering it, we're actually receiving it. So if we go back to our initial trigger now, so let's relook at our piece of paper. We have the stimulus that happened, our trigger. And we have the facts, you know, we have the conversation or whatever it is that happened. And we have the feeling that we're left with. And let's stay clear on our goal here. What we're looking for is the ability to unhook from the wave of emotion or thoughts that are still hanging on. This practice doesn't comment on our external actions at all. So I am not implying at all that if you're in a situation that needs to change, that you don't do anything. Please take care of yourself and advocate for yourself. But this exercise speaks to our ability to develop the skills that allow us to shift our habits of how we are continuing to look outside of ourselves for what we need to meet our internal needs. And when we look outside of ourselves for this, it is unpredictable at best because we can't control how other people behave or act. And what we're talking about here is moving from a role of passivity in meeting our internal needs to acknowledging that it's actually an ability, that we have the ability to care for ourselves, just like we would care for everybody that we love. So let's look at the third part of this again in our notes about the trigger and the situation and the why. We know that this is showing up as our interpretation of the situation. We know that it shows us not only our interpretation, but that it led to the feeling that we had, that the emotion came from the interpretation. And this is the opportunity here. It's the opportunity to see what we really want from the situation, not to change anything externally. But for example, if I make something up, it is not productive for us to wait for 10 or 20 years in anger for somebody close to us to acknowledge us. 
In this situation, what we're really looking for is acknowledgement. And this now shows us what we need to cultivate in ourselves to recognize and remember that we are already whole despite what happened and despite somebody else's behavior. Maybe it looks like acceptance or the desire to be heard or respected. Whatever it is, now you know what it is that you need to cultivate in yourself to unhook from trying to find it externally. And again, how we do this is by sharing it and cultivating it in another person. So let's imagine for a minute that whatever it is that you're looking for with your trigger, that you imagine yourself offering this to somebody else. Probably not the person, if there's another person in your triggering situation, probably not that person. But go with whoever pops into your mind here. Somebody that you can share with naturally. And recognize that you already have that quality that you're seeking. Because it's not only in the hands of another. If you didn't already have that quality, you would not be able to share it. And we can take this even a step further and offer this to ourselves daily, as a daily practice. When you first wake up in the morning, think about the qualities that you would like to move through your day with a little bit more ease. So maybe that day it's joy or a little bit more tolerance. And now you know what your practice is for that day. Whenever you remember, offer those things to everybody around you or to at least anybody who it comes naturally. Because when you share it, you are naturally cultivating it in yourself and receiving it. So thanks. Thank you all for joining me to talk about emotional immunity. I know that this was a lot that I just shared. And I think that Angela maybe recorded this. I'm not sure. But you can contact me if you have questions about what we just went over. And we can talk via email or maybe even go back and watch part of the recording again and really let this soak in. Because there's a lot of choice and a lot of freedom here for all of us. Thank you, Megan. That was incredible. I think I'm still sitting with all of it. Thank you. Um, that was wonderful. And Megan, do you have the slide with the your email address? Here we go. Perfect. Because we thought people, we would love to have this. It would have been nice for this to be an interactive conversation where people could ask questions and we could kind of hash it out a little bit more. But Technology is just not ready for that yet. So if you have questions, we've provided Megan's email address and you can reach her there. And then uh, I think Jennifer is gonna talk to us a little bit about um, some future events, but Megan, thank you so much for sharing yourself with us. I'm really thank grateful. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank this you. was really nice, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, thank you, Megan. I feel like like Katie, I need to sit with that a little bit and then sit with it tomorrow and sit with it the next day and make it a habit, which takes a while. But what a, um, what a perfect time to have you with us. We actually did plan this in advance to have Megan at our, our spring um, slash summer event. We had no idea that, of course, that the pandemic would be here, but it ended up being a perfect thing, even if we had to do it virtually. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us. If you're interested in joining us for future events, we now have an, uh, an email account. You can send us your contact information. We are slowly putting um, everybody's names in, um, but please feel free to share our information. If you have others you think would enjoy the, um, the group, please uh, feel free to send us their contact information or have them send it to us. 
but it's women empowering women stl at gmail.com. Um, and also, as technology, um, uh, technology uh, groups, we are not, or at least I'm not, um, Katie have, have put us on Instagram yesterday. Mm -hmm. so, and <laughs> I know this is a huge deal. You can follow us on Instagram at women empowering women STL. We anticipate, and I use the term loosely, uh, having some sort of September, October event, maybe sometime in the fall. I'm sure a lot of it's going to depend on um, what's going on uh, around the area. But we, if we can't do it live, maybe we'll come back and do it virtually again. Um, so stay tuned and we'll send contact and um, save the date and all that kind of information as soon as we get it out to all of you. So all the more reason to please keep in touch with us. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Megan, can Thanks. you go back to the first slide really fast? We've had some requests for um, the first couple of slides. Yeah, so I'm going to have to move backwards. So that's OK. Go, yeah. Can you just keep we, talking and like reiterating what you said? Because we all need to hear it <laughs> over and over and over and over again. Actually, I think this is maybe um, the perfect place to say that you know I'm sharing with you all um, my practice, my daily practice, and my journey through this process in kind of a quick summary. So um, be gentle with yourself. I'm offering here what is available and that we all have so many more choices for how we experience our daily life than maybe we're seeing. And just start wherever you are and let what we talked about tonight just kind of marinate and soak in. And I am open to having this discussion um, privately if you want to clarify some things and reiterate what some great daily practices are if you want to just try and take some baby steps. But most of what is necessary here is just the willingness to look at what we're taking as objective truth often is just our interpretation and that there is a lot of room there for choice. And that, you know, a few minutes every day of pausing and looking at what we can cultivate in ourselves by sharing it with other people will shift everything. That's beautiful. So I guess I can just go through these and just give a few seconds on each slide. And if there's a particular slide that you are hoping for, um, just speak up about it. Carolina, did I get the right slide? She's um, chatting with me. Yes, <laughs> I just wanted a picture for our Instagram thing. Oh, OK, super. Yeah. I like your glasses. They look so cute. This slide that we're on now for anybody that's left about abdominal breathing. You know, if you don't get anything else from this talk, this is the thing. If you are breathing from shallow chest into abdominal breathing, it changes your nervous system and it changes everything. And not so, only that, but physically you feel a lot better if you're oxygenating your body. On, on that point, I, um, Megan is gracious and brave enough to, she did a, a YouTube video <laughs> oh, yeah. with abdominal massage that, mm -hmm. and, and also breath work. And so you can find her on YouTube. And I, I, I've thought about breath work for forever. And I, for some reason, this really opened up some new thoughts for me. And just the yeah. abdominal massage, just opening up your abdominal cavity. It's, it's really wonderful. So you can find some more on that on YouTube. Yeah, you can find me on YouTube just under Megan Lamp. My first name is spelled really differently. It's M-A-E. So that's the only thing that you need to, I don't know if there's any other Megan Lamps on YouTube or not, but M-A-E. And there's a series of free demo videos that are available on that um, YouTube channel. And it starts with um, a de quick demo. I think it's just five or six minutes. I can't remember on abdominal breathing where I talk through that. And then it moves to how to um, do massage on your own abdomen. 
because if you, the, the root of our system is in our abdomen, and if you can get your energy moving and pull your breath down into your abdomen, it really facilitates both physical and mental grounding. And then there's a few other demo videos on how to yourself at home while we're distancing and we can't see each other state well-being. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Great to be with you. Do Angela, are there any other questions that you well, if anyone else has any questions, we have, um, you could unmute yourself. We've got a few, I mean, we're, unless we're rushing, we, you can unmute. Um, I'll let you unmute. <laughs> I will stop the controls. I've been muting everybody. <laughs> I feel like I have the power. I will unmute, you can unmute yourself and ask any questions. And Angela, you could probably stop the recording and people can ask questions without being recorded if that makes them feel more comfortable. Great, done. We're done recording.